Molly would take her purse, her beaded purse, and she'd get the best wig she had, and she'd trundle her way up the hill from Angel in Angelina Heights, and then down the rise uh, to the bus station, going to work. Work started at 7 a.m. in the morning. She'd been running the business for 745 dog years since, since the early 20s. In fact, she used to say, I get my best sleep there. And they provided flannel for suits. Flannel for suits. <laughs> That's seemed she had this big party at the Fourth of July with her, with uh, her step her stepdaughter's family, and uh, the only problem is it's not seven a.m. in the morning. The sun is going down, not coming up. Her stepdaughter once again notice, notices her walking with her beaded purse and her wig, and her her morning oh, Monday morning dress, and runs out after her, half disgusted and half something that's hard to understand, and grabs her by the sleeve just as she's getting, getting toward the bus station, and says, uh, uh, In 1920, Molly is a 20-something girl from uh, a Jewish home, a broken Jewish home in the Midwest, who arrives in Los Angeles uh, to find her husband her husband to be. This man who'd been writing her, whom she knew from she knew from the old town. She arrives unfortunately noticing that he's been adding to his harem of women and he has this girlfriend who's so a little rounder, fuller lips, uh, nice eyes, uh, got a kind of cute manner, not too clever. She begins to realize that her chances are not very good. <laughs> there she is. She's living in uh, Boyle Heights. Molly is at home on the weekends. She's barely at home during the week. But one weekend is particularly important for her. She saw Gloria Swanson. It's hard to explain how important Gloria Swanson was. She was the most famous, or certainly the highest paid movie actress of the 20s. Pickford was old news, Gloria Swanson was this huge star. And Gloria Swanson had lived nearby, just a, few, just a few houses away, up until
in the business, Molly uh, becomes very, very acutely aware of how much is taken from her. She even develops this belief that a little bit of swindling, honest swindling is okay. And it may not be very much, might just be buttons or it might just be a little extra cloth and so forth. And it becomes a kind of understanding as to how much you glean. And certainly Jack is a gleaner. He's, he's out there taking stuff, there's no question. And it, she tries to set up something a little bit more fundamental with him because it, uh, he, he's a vampire and a gleaner, a gleaner if, if, if she's not careful. But it, it, there is a kind of innocence about the whole thing. And then she decides that the one person who's not been allowed to swindle is herself. So she begins to set up her own, it's hard to know what to call it because it, it's a safety deposit box. She puts in about $135 a month. That's over $1,000 a year. That's a lot of money. She's able to, well, cook the books, you might say a little bit. And then in the, along the process, she also has access to uh, interesting deals with jewelry. It is the Great Depression, after all. So that means you can get incredible deals if you have some money. And she's managed to somehow put, put the investments together. The, she owns a little extra housing now. And even though she had to shrink back, she's surviving uh, reasonably well, even during the Great Depression. She's managing. And she put some jewelry in there. Obviously, why would Molly be wearing jewelry? It just doesn't make any sense. So she's collecting it like an imaginary dowry. And she has this whole belief system about small swindles make, make for an honest person. Something odd. You're going to stop, right? Molly goes to the bank and puts in a brooch in her special dowry account. On the way back from there, she sees Dollar Day, Dollar Day, which is along Broadway, and gets very interested, uh, spends some time in Dollar Day again, uh, mixing with the mobs of, of women as she was oh, very interested. Why is she very interested? Molly was never very interested. It was like a busman's holiday. She just went. She went to Dollar Day because it was there. She wanted to see what these people who who were beneath her in terms of customer because she couldn't. They couldn't afford her stuff. But she she was there. She was walking walking away. Had some some clothing and a little bag. And then in the corner of her eye, as she walks toward the ho uh, uh, one of the hotels, there there is Jack. But Jack's not her husband now. See, this is in the late forties. That there's Jack. And her new husband, Walt, who are supposed to not be seeing each other after all, former husbands don't usually meet on dates, they're talking together, and they're very involved. So she, she notices them through the window, then they notice her, and their eyes kind of like <laughs> a little surprised. And, and then she goes in to talk to them, obviously. Now she has to say hello. After all, she is uh, the one connection, presumably, they're supposed to have. I still look surprised. Um, have some food, they go off, they go into a, uh, a drive. The drive is, is long and languorous, uh, um, relatively speaking. Uh, there are lots of ways to go to uh, Angelina Heights, uh, up the hills and around through Chavez Ravine and up, uh, up through some of the bridges and down and back and forth. And it, cars are perfect for arguments. So an argument brews between the two men, which surprises her even more. Jack is screaming about... In 1959, uh, Jack starts a diary. He keeps it for about two years. Uh, uh, it's pencil at night and pen in the morning. He has this fantasy, as often 
with Jack that, Jack, that the, he was writing some kind of masterpiece uh, that this this would be the thing would show that even though he had some skill at the piano and some skill at dancing, uh, some skill at keeping businessmen interested over over three or four cocktails or or is it thirty uh, that that he has that he wears a, a suit well. That, that he he could have been an actor, they could have been this and that, but finally he's found his niche. He could talk about his own decay. This is this is his hope. <laughs> and out of his own decay, he has a story, and he's work, working on different details. He's living in Bunker Hill now, and clearly the, the, there's plenty of decay to study because Bunker Hill is being torn down, like his own life is being torn down. He he's watching uh, different parts of the city disappearing, and parts that he knew very well, his father's own house, the house that he grew up in, it's all, it's all sort of changing. It's changing towards something that's rude and more asphalt and less green and so forth. All these meanings are, are very sensible. He, he, he still meets Walt various times and uh, he mentions at one point that uh, he and Walt, uh, well, they, they really do feel fundamentally, uh, after everything is over or gone or continuing, that Molly was kind of a special looking woman and she had the kind of grace and beauty, but maybe not beauty, but and by the time they finished explaining how beautiful she was, it, you, you could have probably wanted to throw them down a, down a cliff. I mean, it's not very flattering, but he writes about her in a kind of mawkish way maybe. And then there's a break, there's a break in the text, a clear break, and he gets into more pen and more scribbling out and things are really blotted out. Uh, it clearly, Walt is gone. Something's happened to him. And it's like that break is like the break in so many stories. How do you feel that? Because he's not gonna tell you in his diary what actually happened or how he was involved. But it's clear that he feels connected somehow. And that in some magical way, I suppose, magical, he feels as, as if he has to keep a low profile because something bad will happen if he changes his life. So now he, he lives very much like another older man going to Pershing Square in the day and going off to Bunker Hill to watch it disappear at night. He becomes another f faded suit uh, in, in the changing city.
northwest of the Pasadena Freeway and just north of downtown Los Angeles, covered on two sides by Elysian Park, is an area of land that has remained an island of isolation for many years. This area, just three minutes from the heart of the city, is known as Chavez Ravine. The hills of Chavez Ravine were at one time a haven for Mexican-Americans and Mexican nationals. As the years passed, the city developed on all sides. The people tried unsuccessfully to obtain improvements that would have made the ravine into a normal residential area. As the population increased, the ravine became filled with wooden shacks. The area became known as one of the greater Los Angeles slum districts called Dogtown by patrolling police officers. I came to Los Angeles in 1929 when they couldn't even, even cross Washington Boulevard on Central Avenue. Let me tell you why it was so hurtful to me to be segregated. I thought I was different. I just knew they wouldn't segregate me. And I got to the drill tower in my ROTC uniform ready to risk my life for my country. I was stunned when they told me to go to Central Avenue. I was a West Sider. Where on Central Avenue? 14th and Central, across the street from the Coca-Cola building. How wonderful it was to be a fireman when we couldn't go into private industry. They used to line up in front of the station like that long picture. There's a fireman in a uniform looking so handsome. I came to Los Angeles in 1929. When, when we began these interviews, and there's so many that we couldn't include, 
we thought we were going to simply locate Molly's world and details about Molly's world, but we were continually locating details that were half remembered, barely remembered or often forgotten and lost and couldn't possibly be known to her because if they were known to her, she would have been someone too complete and therefore not human. She would have been just a PC machine. She would have been a gumball machine for information. It, she, it, it wouldn't be possible. And it seems that we became almost more interested in locating what she couldn't find, what she had to forget, what she couldn't locate. And it's very obvious why it's such a great pleasure to not be constrained simply by the legibility of the story, but by the humanity of a moment that somehow is led by this woman, by this woman's life. It's a kind of journey through Dante's Inferno, I guess, but it's not really an inferno. It's just a neighborhood. It's just a city. And the images and the people's voices take on a certain magic, not, not because they're telling you all the truth, but because once in a while in these anecdotes, you begin to imagine a character who should belong in Molly's story, and you begin to understand why people struggle so hard to, to weave it all together and not burden, put rocks in the pockets of, of, of this character and, and you know, have her drown in the river, you know, that sort of thing. The, the, the complexity becomes such a great pleasure. It's such a pleasure noticing what she wouldn't have noticed, beginning to see the, the boundaries of her awareness, beginning to understand what is or isn't you know, a person and how limited we are ourselves. So in a way, the absences become much more present in these interviews than anything else. General, no one could tell the difference between a Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and we were at war with Japan, so basically the Japanese were the enemies, and the Japanese Americans here in America, as well as the Japanese nationals here, were treated as enemy, the enemy. So to, uh, shall we say, stop from being picked on, the Chinese people used to wear badges saying, I'm Chinese American. And many of the stores also uh, noted that they're Chinese Americans. But even in the little Tokyo area, some of the stores put in they were Japanese Americans, but that didn't make any difference. Still, they had the tag of being Japanese or the enemy. Jeff our family was very weird, but not just our family, city terrorists, because we were very afraid of the police. We were not afraid of gangs. We were not afraid of Latinos or, or even really afraid well, of blacks. We yeah. were afraid of the police. And the, the word out was, particularly for girls, that if you were caught out after dark, you were going to get raped by the police. And this was just the feeling of the whole community. My own experience doesn't verify that. But, but I heard you know, there were articles written and stories told how, about, you know, I think most families were afraid to report them. You know what I mean? First, for the honor of the girl. You know, these were basically Latino families that had this happen to. And, and uh, feared that there would be repercussions. During that day, dancing was popular. And then the, if the girls didn't dance, they weren't too popular. <laughs> so those that could dance, oh, you always had a good time. You always had dates. <laughs> As the big band era started to die down in the middle 60s, the dance halls started all closing down. Television, people stayed home more. People stayed home and watched uh, the big shows on TV. I went downtown with my mother and we took the red car. And we were always a little nervous, I have to say, you know, because and uh, no matter what, that your parents teach you that racism is really bad, which my mother certainly did, and certainly was active in things for the NAACP and stuff like that. Familiarity is the best way to uh, get rid of prejudice because I was unfamiliar with blacks. And when you went downtown, a lot of the people were black downtown. And I remember being, uh, I remember being very young and going down there as a child and pointing at one of them and actually staring and because I, I don't think I'd seen a black person, you know, and, 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 and my mother trying to distract me, you know what I mean, because she knew I didn't mean anything bad, I just 
was looking, you know what I mean? But that's how segregated the city was. That's how segregated it was, that you would never see a black person. Japanese. Brooklyn Avenue had a tremendous sidewalk population. The sidewalks were filled with people shopping, buying the markets. In front of each market, there was a herring barrel. And if you wanted a Schmaltz herring, the waiter would come out, and my mother would reach to buy herring, whatever kind. And he'd reach in there and pull out a herring, drip it, shake it, wrap a piece of newspaper. You bought, you bought. And so I called my article Herring Barrels on Brooklyn Avenue. My mother used to go to the fish store on Brooklyn Avenue and she would see the display of fish on ice, no refrigeration in those days. And since we're neighborhood stores, my mother was known to all these people. So when she wanted a certain fish, like making a filth of fish on a Friday night, he would say, oh, wait, Mr. Shulman, uh, I've got some fresh fish in the back. He'd go out in the case of the wood box with the ice. He'd bring back nice frozen fish. The fruits and vegetables were always fresh. You can buy three pounds of grapes for 10 cents, buy a bunch of carrots for a nickel. Uh, bread costs 10 cents a loaf, eggs 20 cents a dozen. Pour a milk for a dime. This is how people shop, and this is how they live. If I were writing this novel completely, from, from cover to cover, building it around this one woman, she becomes a set of eyes and a, a pattern that you pile everything else upon and around. She becomes a kind of container for the whole story. Her life is very ordinary. It would seem very ordinary. She arrives after the First World War. She is, shall we say, given a husband. She doesn't have much of her own energy, uh, except a business sense. She's very strong in business, knows how to get people to do their job. She's a kind of bookkeeper-like personality. She runs a business dealing with clothing, they have two stores. One store is where the displays for fancier suits and where her first husband can feel important because he needs to feel important. He's just not smart enough for anything else. As long as he feels important, what else is lacking in his life doesn't matter. Nineteen forty-seven was kind of an interesting year because I remember um, going to school and hearing about the Black Dahlia. I took the Crenshaw bus, and it, I think they discovered her body near Crenshaw someplace. And this was January fifteenth, nineteen forty-seven. I remember, and it, it's funny because in those days they didn't go into details about how about her murder, which was a really savage murder, and it wasn't until. My dad was actually in Mexican town by Olvera Street on Main Street, which was sort of like the overflow from the little Tokyo area. We were welcomed in the Mexican community, so my dad had a Mexican grocery store there by Olvera Street. A big Where we are right now, it was where the mansions were. That, that property had been leveled down. And uh, all those, those great old uh, steeples and turrets and had all kinds of cocos and beautiful woodworks. Bunker Hill contained many of the palatial mansions that were built in the turn of the century, before I was even born, in the 1890s and the 1900s. These people lived 
very highly placed socialized. These early mansions, which I never really saw except from the outside. Mr. Bradbury, as many of the early inhabitants of the area, were making their fortunes from mining and from timber, which made it possible, like in Bradbury's case, to build the Bradbury building by George Wyman. I was uh, just got my 11th birthday when we left uh, Los Angeles. Everyone knew we were going to be removed from the West Coast, but no one knew when and where exactly. So that's when we found out on May the 3rd, 1942, there was an order from uh, General John D. Whip, commander of the Western Forces, and it happened to be Exclusion Order 33, which said that we had to report to this Christian church right here in the Japanese community on May the 9th. So basically, we had one week's official notice to pack up and move out. Since we're at all Japanese school, Japanese American students, in preparation for that, what we did was uh, take individual photographs and exchange photographs. So I have maybe 15, 20 pictures to this day from my classmate because of the outbreak of the war. But uh, during the war, Little Tokyo was empty and vacated, so it became Bronzeville. Many people from the South came here to Los Angeles to work in the war industries, such as the aircraft industry or the shipbuilding industry here in Southern California. And being close proximity to the Union Station over here, many of them just ended up here in uh, First Street or Little Tokyo and it was predominantly uh, black Americans, so they lived here in Little Tokyo and changed the name to Bronzeville. And Bronzeville existed until about 1945, 1946, at the end of World War II, when many of the Japanese owners started to come back to Little Tokyo and then reestablish Little Tokyo. It seems like most of the old folks I've talked to about the uh, problem of moving have always uh, felt that uh, if they figured something out for them, uh, that is, the government, it'd be an old folks' home under a different...
check the facts on this story. Seems like an awful lot of public housing, 10,000 units. Wonder if we really have that many slums. See if Los Angeles needs that much housing. Okay, where do I get this information? How do I know? You got a housing authority, look in a phone book. Housing Authority of the City of Los Angeles, that's it, out on East 1st Street. So I went out to their offices. I talked to the director himself. He showed me a series of maps of the slums of Los Angeles. I got the lowdown, maps, statistics, the whole works. I was told that the 1940 census reported 58,000 families living in the slums. I didn't more than half believe it, not in Los Angeles. Amnesiac character played by Laura. In the motion picture Falling Down, the character played by Michael Douglas suffers a mental breakdown and he wanders alone into one of the gang infested neighborhoods of Los Angeles in the shadows of its downtown area. In Rudolf Mate's 1950 DOA, the lead character played by Edmund O'Brien cruises down the dark Broadway Boulevard in downtown LA. The camera lingers in front of the automobile until at one point, O'Brien's character lunges from the car and races past camera. The film Heat, a group of highly organized criminals led by Robert De Niro, rob an armored money truck here on the street beneath the 10 and 110 freeway interchanges. The crime is made possible with a stolen tow truck, which they drive under the 110. 